Thanks very much for the introduction, and thank you all for coming this, um, actually it's afternoon now, good afternoon. Thank you for coming, excited to speak here. This is my first time at ShmooCon and my first time presenting, so I'm really pumped to be here. Oop, that is not what I wanted to do. Not the way I had anticipated starting. And that's not right either. Hang on. Come on. a little tricky. Still not quite right. Damn it. Yeah, the challenge is getting the mouse over top of it because I don't see that. Extend your desktop? Yeah, how can I get to that though? Oh, I still do it. Somehow here. Sorry. How do you get to your, your display settings? Or like where your projector is? Uh, well, that's the problem. They're on the other. They're on the other one? Yeah. So, how do you, I'm not sure how to do it on a Mac though. Yeah, let's just do this. Because you have to extend the desktop. All right, coach me through getting to the uh, thing. I think we're closer there. Let's see. Let's go to displays. That don't work. Yeah, so let's get rid of that. No? Okay, all right, thank you very much. Nothing like a little AV glitch to start off the presentation. So let's get rolling here. So who am I? I'm a guy who clearly can't work PowerPoint very well. But besides that, I'm an information security professional. I've been doing information security for about half my career. I did network engineering for about the other half. So I'm not a software developer. And you might ask, why is a person who's not a software developer talking to us about containers? I'll tell you why, because I worked with a bunch of application developers who have been using and aggressively embraced containers, and I find that security folks don't have the first clue what this is and what it means. And if we're going to build and run secure software, we need to have the security folks aware and understanding what containerization is, what microservices is, what does it mean, and how do we secure it. So that's why I'm here trying to share the very basics about what containers are and microservices and ways in which the security and the dev groups can work together to really improve security. So here's what I'm going to talk about today. We're going to do a little background introduction. Uh, we'll talk about what the containers are and how they're used and why they're used. We'll talk a little bit about service delivery. In other words, how is software built, developed, and deployed? Uh, how does microservices play a role in that? And once, very touch very briefly on the DevOps phenomenon. I'm not going to spend too much time there. I'm going to spend a good bit of time about container security. What are the challenges? And how can we leverage the capabilities that containers offer to improve security of our software? Talk about some recommendations. And lastly, I'll spend a little bit of time talking about the NIST and CSA Container Security Working Group uh, that my uh, partner, Anil, and I have been working on very hard to further define some standards. And if there's anyone interested in participating at the end of the talk, I'll talk about how you can get involved too. Things that you're going to take away from here today. I expect that when you leave, you will understand the very basic fundamentals about what an application container is. You'll understand the differences between virtual machines and containers. And if you remember nothing else, that's what I would really like for you to take away from this, is the differences between an application 
container and a VM because they are not the same. I'd like you to understand a little bit about the security challenges of containers and also what the advantages are of using it. Some best practices and lastly, I hope you're gonna leave with some resources that you can go do some further research if you're interested. So a little bit of background. Let's take a step back and look at what virtualization is because it's essential to really relook at what virtualization is and why folks have embraced it to really understand the drive and the need for containers. Virtualization is a technology that allows us to run multiple operating systems on a physical computer. Two basic kinds, we've got type one and type two hypervisors. Uh, the type uh, one hypervisor is like VMware vSphere, you know, the ESXi offering, or the hosted or type two hypervisor, which is where when you run something like um, VMware Fusion or Oracle's VirtualBox on your own machine on top of an operating system. But the virtual machine itself is a computing system that believes it has access to hardware and resources and it does not know that it is virtualized. Why do people virtualize? We've got five reasons on the screen here why people virtualize. We can go through them all, but essentially the thing that's important to, to note is what's missing from this list? These reasons, security is one, but that's not where I was going, but that's a very good point. These are all operational and management reasons to virtualize. There's nothing on here about how to, why you know, it helps you build software or make software, nothing on here about this. You virtualize for economic and operational reasons. So, talking about security virtualized solutions, let's look at these and some of the considerations. And virtualization's been around for a while, so we know how to do this securely. That's certainly not to say everyone does it securely, but we know what to do. We know that we need to focus on isolation. We need to make sure that we protect the hypervisors from the guest virtual machines. An analogy to that is you don't let anyone into your physical data center where your servers physically reside. Why would you, through your virtual infrastructure controller, allow anyone to have privileges there? You need to take advantage of role-based access. Ensure that you protect the hypervisor itself. You also need to protect, in terms of isolation, the guest virtual machines from other guest virtual machines. You don't want one guest virtual machine to be able to impact another virtual machine. You want to make sure that you've secured the virtualization features. And one of the principal examples there is when you're able to migrate a machine, a virtual machine, from one physical host to another, you want to make sure that that transmission is secured, that someone can't mend in the middle your movement of a VM from one host to another. You've got to adapt operational, adopt operational processes that match the virtualized environment. The old IT data center processes don't work in a virtualized environment. Virtualization affords great speed and scale, and if you're used to a physical world, you're not gonna be able to keep up. And that is both for the data center management as well as in the security space. You need to be able to enforce security policy inside your virtualized environment. This is one that, that happens quite often in organizations, manage VM sprawl. It is so easy to spin up machines, you need to have some process to get rid of ones when they're not needed. And lastly, you need to make sure that your security procedures are optimized for a virtualized environment. Okay, enough about virtualization, that's the background. Now let's jump into what are containers and microservices. Well, it just so happens that NIST released a draft last February that defines what microservices and application containers are. And this is useful because it gives us some of the language and the context to understand this, and we can look at this. It's important to understand the definitions when we want to look at models and how we secure things. So looking specifically into what is an application container, uh, you note that when you look at there, it's talking about running application on a shared operating system. Remember, when we talked about hardware virtualization, we talked about running operating systems on shared hardware. So you can see the, begin to see the difference what a container is. Container is abstracting the operating system. Application containers, they're isolated from the other application containers, but they do share the resources of the underlying host. Diving in a little deeper into what is a container, it is a kernel level resource management facility. Again, this gets down to the key point that the 
container is a resource that allows the application running in that container to think that it's on its own, but it's really not. It's leveraging a shared operating system. The container creates space for the files and processes that are isolated, and you'll note I'm going to say isolated or isolation a lot this morning because it's important. Uh, one of the key things about Linux containers is they use namespaces and C groups, and if you're not familiar with those terms, I'll explain them a little bit later. When we talk about container solutions, there are many different offerings out there. So the most popular ones are Docker, that's probably the one most folks have heard about, but there's also Rocket by CoreOS, LXC, and several others too. Docker isn't the only container solution, but right now it does seem to be the most popular one. The other thing to note is you now can run containers on Windows servers. Microsoft does support a container solution. Anyone doing that? I don't know of anyone that's doing that, but I'm sure some folks are. Okay, good. Let's talk about the differences between virtual machines and containers, because I said that if there's one thing you take away from here, I really want you to know that virtual machines and containers are not the same and where they're different. So first off, a little Fight Club meme here. Containers are not virtual machines. I'm glad somebody thought that was funny, good. A little graphical depiction here to help understand. If you look at the, the page there, on the right side you'll see the depiction of a container, and on the left side you'll see the virtual machine. Now in this particular depiction, you'll note that this is showing a type two hypervisor, which means it's hosted, which means there's an operating system underneath the application running as the hypervisor. And in that we see two virtual machines running. And each virtual machine is a complete instantiation of a guest operating system, the binaries and libraries, and then applications above that. So when you look at that, you've got two virtual machines side by side on top of a hypervisor, on top of a host OS, on top of server hardware. Now if it just so happens that those machines are running the same operating system, it's a little bit inefficient because you've got complete duplicate copies likely, if it's the same OS, running. On the container side, to the right, you'll notice we've got the server hardware. On top of that, we've got the host OS, the kernel running. And then on top of there is the container daemon. On top of that, you've got two containers running. You'll note that the first one, the one to the left side, actually has two applications running in that container, sharing the same binaries and libraries. That's one container. There's a container to the right just running application B, and it has its required binaries and libraries. Another visual depiction, this one shows the virtual machine image. You'll see the infrastructure with the host operating system, the hypervisor on top. You've got three virtual machines, each with its own guest OS, each with its own binaries and libraries, and each with three different applications running. Another depiction of a container solution here, infrastructure operating here is specific to Docker, but that could be any container runtime environment. And then on top of that are the containers themselves. Here we have three containers. Each container is running one application. And in that container are the binaries and libraries that are needed for that application. So a container is an implementation of operating system virtualization. It abstracts the operating system from the application. The application thinks it's got its own operating system along with the resources that are available to the operating system. So let's just talk a minute about why that is important. What's the big benefit of that? Application portability. Your application is now abstracted away from the operating system. So it's very, very portable. More about virtual machines versus containers. So these are the key points here to take away about what's different about an application container from a virtual machine. They're not the same thing. The containers leverage the abstraction of the operating system. A virtual machine leverages abstraction of the hardware from the hypervisor. Another key difference, containers are run. You actually execute the container. A virtual machine has to boot. So the significant difference there is time. It takes time to boot an operating system. A container can be run very, very quickly. How can we deploy containers? We have a lot of different options for container deployment. 
But at the core, it comes down to these four options. You can deploy a container on bare metal. You've got a physical server, you deploy an operating system, you deploy a container runtime environment, and then you run your containers. But you can also deploy that environment into a virtual machine. So you can install your hypervisor system, you can install a virtual machine running the host OS that you want to run for your container environment, you install the container engine on that virtual machine, and then you run your containers inside that environment. Now, much like a virtual machine, you can also do this in infrastructure as a service. So you can go out to EC2, to Azure, you can spin up a system. When you spin up the system, which you've installed the OS, you can then go through all those steps I just talked about with the virtual machine. And then lastly, there's also platform as a service options in which you can deploy containers. So EC2 operates a container option, a container service. You can run your container natively inside of EC2's container option. In that case, you're not worried about spinning up the host OS. That's provided for you as platform as a service. I want to go through some terms that are important to understand about application containers. I'll talk briefly about the host, container image, registry, orchestration, and a bit about namespace and cgroups. So first, let's talk about a host. The host is the physical or virtual machine, because it could be a virtual machine, but from the point of view of the container, the host is the system that has the operating system running upon it, as well as the container runtime environment. So you can't do a container talk, apparently, without having a picture of a container ship, so I'm complying with this container presentation mandate. The visual analogy is that you've got the host, which is the big ship, okay, so that's the system upon which the container runtime environment is, and then all the shipping containers are the containers themselves running applications. The analogy somewhat fits uh, because the insides of the shipping containers are isolated from the other containers, and they can come and go without disturbing the host or the other systems. The next term that we need to talk about and understand here is a container image. So this is how containers are actually built. A container image is a read-only template. It, it doesn't get modified. You run the image and it instantiates the container and stands it up. But the image itself is immutable. But where do you get the images from? You can build one yourself. Good option. You can take an existing image and change it and modify it and customize it the way you like for your needs. Or you can download and then use an image that someone else created. Now, the issue with the third one, you have some potential trust issues, right? If you're downloading an image from a registry, I haven't talked about registry yet, but I will in a minute, that you don't control or trust, how do you know what's in that registry? I mean, how do you know what's in that image? So, some things to keep in mind. Registry. A registry is a place that helps maintain and organize the container images. You can have a public registry, which is one that would be up on the internet that almost anyone could access and contribute to. You do potentially have some trust issues with the public registry, but hey, it's great if you're wanting to learn things. You can go up to the registry, you can pull down a Docker image for almost anything that you want. Somebody's made it up there. Now, that might not be made securely, but it's up there. You can also run your own private registry. If you've got a company and you're working on containerization microservices, you're probably gonna wanna stand up your own private registry that's on premise. Another term that's really important to understand when we talk about containers, and this really gets into some of the principal value of what the container technology offers in terms of deployment, is orchestration. So orchestration is the process and tools for managing the, the turn up and the turn down of containers. The automation that's available through the orchestration, orchestration solutions today is immense. This really allows us to ensure that we can spin up new containers when we need for scale or capacity reasons, and also we can turn them down when they're not needed. We can orchestrate the deployment and standing up of new containers if we made a change to the image. This helps us ensure consistency and the automation capabilities that this provides are immense. This is where we really start getting into this concept that people are talking a lot about now, infrastructure as code. You're able to script and automate the deployment of the systems. You don't have to go into 
uh, virtual machine environment and, and set complicated and sometimes manual processes for adding another virtual machine. You can leverage the power of the orchestration tool to do that for you based upon known set rules. I've listed on the screen there some of the more popular uh, orchestration tool solutions. Kubernetes is uh, one of the most popular ones out there, but there are the others I listed too. Namespace. I mentioned before we're going to talk about namespace and C groups. Namespace and C groups are very important to understand, particularly if you're trying to understand how to secure containers, because they provide some features and controls that allow you to secure the containers from each other and from the host. So namespace provides abstraction to ensure container isolation. When you use Docker, they create a namespace for each container, and there are different kinds of namespaces, but namespace is one of the critical isolation features. Now, if anyone went to the talk yesterday on how to improve container security, you'll note that there were some other options provided, and I think it's really worth looking into some of those that were provided. They were talking specifically about the Rocket uh, container solution, but that was a very good talk. If you didn't catch that one yesterday, a bit more advanced than mine here, but it'd be worth catching up on that one if you didn't see it. C groups, control groups. So control groups are a way to ensure that containers have access to their fundamental underlying resources of the host, but ensuring that each you know, container is prevented from taking too much of the resources and potentially starving another container. C groups can control access to things, resources like the CPU, so you got your compute time, your memory, and also network access. You can see where this would be important because remember the abstraction that the container runtime environment provides to the container is that it's not aware there are other processes running on that host. So it only sees what it can see, and that's done through the namespace, but the C groups are what allow you to ensure that one container cannot hog the resources, which would potentially be detrimental to the other containers. So now let's talk about what is Docker. Okay, Docker is not a replacement for containers. Docker is a runtime environment. It's a platform. It allows you to build, ship, and run distributed applications in containers. Relatively new, released in 2013, but has got massive adoption out there. There are other container solutions, but it appears that Docker is the front runner right now. Docker does, and this is not unique to Docker, but containers help with portability, and they're very application-centric. Another plug, Docker is not a virtual machine. Let's talk about the components of Docker briefly so you understand how this particular thing works. There's an engine, a daemon, and a client. If we look at a depiction of this visually, you'll see here that there are two containers. You've got a green container and a blue container. The green has two applications running, A and B. The blue has three, C, D, and E. Each container has its own binaries and libraries that are needed for those applications, running on top of the Docker engine. Embedded in the engine is a Docker daemon to which a Docker client can connect. The engine runs on top of the host operating system, Linux, and that's running on a physical server. Or it could be a virtualized server. Another point to understand, and this one for me personally was very difficult to understand, and I'll admit that I'm not an expert in this area. It's still confusing to me. Containers and networking. The way they work is still evolving. It's changing. Uh, fortunately, though, there are some new solutions coming out that abstract much of the complications of how the networking functions in a container. But the default is a bridged environment inside uh, the host. And it's the host is called Docker Zero, that host bridge group there. The containers are typically instantiated with RFC 1918 space. And the default is a, is a slash 16 network. So inside the host, how do you protect the containers from talking to each other? Well, it runs IP tables. You end up using a lot of NAT. But as I mentioned, there are options that have come out now to help you manage the networking of your containers. Got Weave, Flannel, Contive is a particularly interesting one. Uh, and there are also software uh, defined networking solutions for containers as well coming along. This is an area that's still developing. A lot of folks that initially went 
into containers early on? Are we looking at their networking because there are much more flexible solutions now? When we talk about container networking, there are two main networking models that exist today. We've got the container network model, CNM. This is Docker's lib network. This is the default Docker networking option. You also have uh, an option put out by CoreOS, the container network interface, CNI. I'm going to change gears a little bit now. We, we understand the basics of what a container is and the different components involved in delivering a container solution to talk a little bit about the evolution of software delivery. And this, while it's background, is really important to understand why containers are attracting so much adoption and also why security practitioners really need to wake up and learn this technology because change is coming. The way that applications are built and pushed out to production is significantly changing. We look at the screen at the top, you'll see custom bash scripts about the, from the 90s to the late 2000s. You had mutable infrastructure. This is back when, at least at my company, we named servers after dead rock stars. So we had Janice and we had Jimmy, and we knew these boxes. They had names. And I don't just mean like, okay, it had a host name. I mean, people would refer to it. Oh, I need to go fix Jimmy. Jimmy's got a problem. No, Janice didn't run that line. Janice's backup didn't finish. We knew these systems, and we patched them, and we updated them, but the system was there, and it, was, it stayed for a long life, uh, probably until the hardware gave out. Lots of different differences between the individual systems. They were unique, depending on when you maybe got the hardware, what hardware it was, maybe which particular version of the operating system was available when you deployed it. And we'd like to say, oh, everyone in patches, so it should be the same, but we all know that doesn't happen as well as it should. The late 2000s to about now, we moved into more of an immutable arc infrastructure, where we're beginning to adopt a solution where we don't change things on the system itself, we just replace the system. We're starting to treat servers, instead of like pets, like cattle. When it's done, we get rid of it. This is particularly applicable in the virtualized environment. Would you want to spend all the effort to patch the virtual machine, or would you just want to build up that virtual machine from a new image? Much faster to spin it up from a new gold image. But we still have a lot of differences between the environments. And we do more deployments, but it's slow because we're in a virtualized machine environment. We have to build the image, the virtual machine gold image. We have to boot the virtual machine. All these considerations come into play. And now we're moving into the era of containers. And when I talk about some of the characteristics of this environment, you'll begin to understand why this is so radically different. The infrastructure itself is immutable. We are not going to patch a container. The systems are becoming like cattle. When it's done, you just get rid of it and you get a new one. We don't have an attachment to it. The software is now fully re reproducible in all environments. So that means if I've got the container runtime image on my laptop, I can build a container on my laptop, I can take it into my QA environment, I run it there, I can run it in production. It's the application is detached from my physical hardware. It doesn't matter, which is a huge advantage for developers. This really gives them the freedom to work in an environment that works well for them. We don't have to deal with gigantic tarballs tremendously opportunistic here. And in this new world though, the build development pipeline is now the center of the universe because that's where these pieces are all being put together. You can push things out as quickly as your build pipeline can produce a new image. So what that means, and I'll show a picture of it in a minute and talk about it, but that means that this build pipeline is a tremendous opportunity for automation. So how does the software architecture change here along with this new uh, environment here? Well, software architectural changes are being driven by adoption of the DevOps mentality, where your developers are operators and the operators are also developers. It's a combined function. We're going to define monolithic applications in a minute, but we're seeing a trend where monolithic architectures are being replaced by microservices architectures, particularly for those organizations that have adopted a DevOps culture. Talking about monolithic architectures, essentially what that means is it's one gigantic blob, a 
Okay, so everything is on that one system. They're highly dependent. They're very interconnected. It would be very hard to make a change to one, compo one portion of the application without impacting another one because it's monolithic. It is one piece. They're not functionally separate. Compared to a newer microservices architecture, the basic functions are decomposed into smaller subsets. And those decomposed subsets have defined ways of communicating with the other ones through either standardized protocols or well-documented APIs. This decoupling and moving towards a modular architecture for the application allows us to make changes in one component without impacting the other one. This does allow for continuous integration. Oop, wrong way, there we go. I talked about the NIST SP800-180 draft that was released last February. Here's the definition of microservices from there. You'll see it's essentially the same thing I just described, decomposition, loosely coupled patterns, well-defined APIs, independent of any vendor, product, or technology. So how do the containers and microservices work together? Well, containers can be a very efficient way to deploy, manage, and scale an application that's built with a microservices architecture. But with that said, there's nothing that prevents you from running monolithic applications in containers. Uh, there are some advantages to be had there, although if you do that, you're really missing the principal advantage of the build pipeline that you would get and the ability to have those functions decoupled. But what we see happening is that many organizations are embracing containers, understanding how they work, understanding the build pipeline, and then beginning to build new applications based upon microservices architectures and plan to migrate their legacy applications into a microservices architecture. But that takes time, so that doesn't happen overnight. So why the big focus on containers? Uh, two principal reasons as I see it. One, the software de delivery. The ability to build the pipeline and produce immutable artifacts, which will offer significant benefits for security. The other piece of the software delivery uh, that's very, very important and why containers are being seen as a huge advantage is because of the fact that there's so many opportunities to introduce automation into that build pipeline. Second major area of focus for why people adopt containers is a software deployment model. It's much, much easier to deploy things on a repetitive basis once you've set up the pipeline. That's great for developers. They can move through cycles very quickly. It does create some challenges for security, principally because security folks haven't adapted to the new mindset. And that's one of the reasons why I'm giving this talk is so everyone can begin to understand what the containers are and what the advantages are for security. We need to rethink how we do our security checks. So here's a graphical depiction of a development pipeline. Uh, you'll see the developer there sitting at his keyboard. He pushes his code up into Git. It goes into the pipeline, and an end result is a Docker push with a Docker image being created. It goes up into the registry. Now, the nice thing about this pipeline is that we can do all kinds of tests inside this pipeline. So this is where, and this is the reason why I'm doing this talk is to get security folks involved in the pipeline and talking to the developers. Because if, I mean, the developers are already doing checks, but they need the insight of the security folks to add the security checks into the automated pipeline. The result is that we get software that's been checked before it even exits the build process. This will significantly reduce the amount of vulnerabilities that are in our containers. So again, like I said, uh, this is very beneficial for security. We get black box functional tests inside the build pipeline. We get full security scans inside the pipeline. But those only happen if those checks are built into the pipeline. And who's going to build those checks? Who's going to advise the team that runs the pipeline? We need to check for this. We need to do this. We, we need to add this functionality check. We need to look for this. This is where we really need the InfoSec community to work closely with the development community and get these checks into the pipeline. The benefit, hopefully we catch more and more vulnerabilities and defects before the software gets released into production. Side bonus to all of this, 
Developers get to do just about everything from their laptops. Went through a couple of security concerns real quick here. I talked about this, but we'll go over it. Container isolation. We want to make sure, back to the container ship uh, analogy here, that one container can impact another container. We don't want that to happen. We need to make sure that the container runtime environment provides appropriate isolation between the containers. So whatever a process in one container is doing, it can not adversely impact the other container. We need to ensure that the A container cannot negatively impact the host on which it runs. This guy's having a bad day. How do we do this? Container isolation can be provided through unique namespaces. We want to make sure that the root user of the container maps to a non-root user of the host. Uh, this has been challenging to do up to now, but there are new releases of the container runtime solutions that do provide for unique namespaces. We also need to understand when we're leveraging containers that our traditional security controls may not work. So we may need to rethink how we inject our security controls. And we need to be aware of the new deployment model and make sure that security staff understands and that the development staff work together to build a new model to ensure security checks are done in the build process. As a security person to me, I'm very excited about this because this means, I mean, most security orgs, you never have enough people. But if you can encourage and work with your development team and install automation and automate your security checks into the build pipeline, you're gaining tremendous resources without necessarily even adding a headcount to your org. You got to spend the time to identify what those checks should be and where they should be. But over time, you continuously improve and your pipeline gets better and better and your solutions get more and more secure. So with orchestration, we talked about what orchestration was. How are we going to ensure that orchestration helps with security? Well, we want to make sure that when we leverage the automation capabilities of orchestration, that we take security into mind. Leverage the fact that we can quickly run up a new container. Don't patch old containers. Spin, you know, run new ones. Some use cases for both. When you're developing a microservices architecture, keep a different data store for each microservice. Don't try to intermingle them. That makes it harder. Do a separate build for each microservice. Keep the project separate. Use containers and treat your servers as stateless. It'll make things much easier. So some closing security recommendations. Make sure if you are part of an information security team, make sure the architects understand the container fundamentals. Make sure that both the InfoSec team and the dev team are working together. Identify those tests that you can push in your build pipeline and get them pushed into there. Follow the best security practices. Container security is an evolving field, but there are tremendous resources out there. I've got a page at the end that lists some other ones. There have been quite a few good white papers written about some of the challenges of container security. And lastly, participate in the community. Go to a meetup. Go to a webinar. Talk to people. Reach out. This is a very active community. The DevOps movement has grown very strong. I found it very, very helpful. People are very willing to help. The last thing I want to talk about here in the closing few minutes is the uh, working group that Anil and I co-chair. It's a collaborative effort between NIST and the Cloud Security Alliance, and we are working together to define best practices for application containers and microservices. We've got a draft document that we are working to complete and get submitted in NIST here, and I'm hoping that's going to happen in the next 60 days. But after we've completed the draft NIST document, we will move forward under the guise of the CSA working group and begin to focus on some deployment guidelines and specific advice for organizations looking to leverage containers. This is what we have done to date. We have documented the challenges on a per-use case basis. We've developed a methodology to score those challenges to allow organizations to understand which of the challenges potentially are higher risk or uh, might warrant more attention. And we also have a path forward to get our document pushed out. If you're interested in participating, we do have the working group charter up on that uh, URL there. It's a Google Docs. Uh, the objectives that we're working towards finishing up this quarter, in 21st quarter 2017, is get this document finalized and into NIST so they can get it published. 
Lastly, if you'd like to volunteer, we'd love to help you, uh, to have you help us get this effort completed. Uh, you can reach out to either Anil, who unfortunately couldn't be here today, uh, or to me, and we'd love to get you plugged in and contributing on this effort. As you leave, what should you do? Well, I'd recommend getting some hands-on time with containers. It's very easy. You can go download the Docker toolbox and just get started. They have some labs to walk you through. You'll get your little hello world exercise done. That's always a good one to start with. Uh, go and talk to your DevOps engineering or security team, regardless of what your role is. Find out what their approach is. What are they doing? How can you perhaps play a role in that? Get some secure configurations down. Consider using the Center for Internet Security's uh, Docker Benchmark. It's a very good read. It goes over a lot of the high-level uh, concerns of securing containers. Don't forget, if you're a security person, to consider your compliance requirements. It always should be a concern. And lastly, don't forget about your third parties that you leverage. Everyone is moving towards, I shouldn't say everyone, but many organizations are moving towards adopting containers and microservices architecture. Make sure that you don't forget about third parties that you rely upon who may have adopted microservices and container architectures. You know, make sure that they're doing it securely. And that's what I have. Thank you very much. I've got one other slide here at the end that talks about a list of resources that you can leverage. Let me go back to the end here. Leave that up in case you want a picture. And if there are any questions, you come up to the front, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks very much.